but let's see, just making sure everything looks good. All right, well, my name is Sarah Benson. Uh, I am an education associate for the form department at the Museum of Science in Boston. Uh, I wanna thank you all for joining us this evening and being part of this virtual event. Uh, before we begin, I would ask if we can keep ourselves on mute, just avoid that background noise for now, but we'll be able to talk later on in the evening. If you would like to see closed captions, you can turn those on by using the closed captions button at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Throughout the evening tonight, you will have the opportunity to learn about the tools and trade-offs that resiliency planners around the nation are considering when they're working to increase community resilience to flooding and sea level rise. You'll be able to share your voice about the ways that communities create resilience plans and you can learn about how you can contribute data to help scientists and resiliency planners know about the more resilient and vulnerable areas of your neighborhoods through citizen science. We are super excited tonight to organize these dialogues among groups of people who might not normally have the opportunity to meet one another, to share perspectives, and to work together on these problems facing our regions. These materials we'll use tonight and others that we've created for this project will be adapted and used at 28 other science centers around the United States. And some of you are joining us tonight and participating in this forum. Uh, before we get started, I want to thank uh, our team who's made today's program possible. Uh, this event wouldn't be happening without David Sittenfeld, who is our principal investigator on this project. I would also like to thank Katie Bauer, Janine Mishka, Megan Litweiler, Caroline Nickerson, and Emily Hostetler, who are going to be your group facilitators tonight in those breakout rooms. I also want to thank our partners, uh, Arizona State University, SciStarter, NISNET, and Northeastern University, who have worked with us closely since this project began. Those partners were crucial in the development of the materials that will be used today and in the years to come. I also want to acknowledge the Lowell Institute whose generosity has supported this program. Finally, I would like to support our, or I'd like to thank our supporters from the NOAA Office of Education. The educational materials and the experiences that we've created for you are supported by an environmental literacy grant from the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. They not only provided the financial support through this grant, but they provided us with a ton of knowledge support and connected us with many partners. So before we get uh, started tonight, we have a little bit of housekeeping. Um, you'll notice that this is a Zoom meeting tonight, so you do have access to your microphone and your camera. Um, we ask that you keep yourself muted when you're not speaking. Uh, when we get into those breakout rooms, you'll be able to talk all you want. Um, you're, you can turn your video on at any point. Um, it doesn't matter to us. We would love to see your faces, um, but we especially hope that you're able to turn on your video in those breakout rooms because the point of this discussion tonight is to really have a face-to-face -face discussion and conversation with each other. And that really helps if you can see who you're talking to. Of course, if you're not comfortable with turning your video on, no problems, you don't have to. Uh, you'll notice the chat is also open. Um, that's a place where you can ask any questions tonight or talk with other participants. Um, uh, we'll have two speakers tonight. And if you want to ask any questions to them, you can pop those questions in the chat and they'll try to answer you the best that they can. Um, please plan to stay for the duration of the program. I know that we have a longer program tonight, but I promise it will go by fast. Um, and after we do some quick introductions, we'll be having those facilitated small group discussions uh, in those uh, breakout rooms. But first, I am going to launch a poll. I would love to know where a lot of people are joining us from tonight. Uh, from tonight. A great thing about an online uh, event like this is that you're able to um, come from all different places. Um, so hopefully that poll just popped up on your screen. Um, if you'd like to vote where you're coming from tonight, we have the Boston area, the Northeast area, the Southeast area, Southwest, Midwest, West, or another country. Um, so if that popped up on your screen, feel free to vote. All right, is everyone seeing this poll pop up? Hmm. 
let me relaunch it one more time. Okay. For some reason, I am not getting the results. But maybe we'll try again later because I would love to know where everyone's it's coming. Working now, Sarah. It just kind of took a little while, but it's working now. Okay. I just ended it and relaunched it. So maybe. Hmm. I'm still not seeing the voting come through for some reason. Um, Sarah, if you like, I can read them out to you. Yeah, that'd be great because I so can see them. <laughs> We've had um, 27 of you vote, and I know 34 did before, but we have 16 from the Boston area, three from the Northeast, two from the Southeast, one from the Midwest, three from the West, and two from another country. Well, awesome. Thank you for voting. I don't know why I can't see the results, but that's all right. <laughs> that's really exciting um, to have all these people be able to come and be a part of this event tonight. Um, all right, so our agenda for tonight. I have done most of my welcome tonight. And then we're gonna hear from two great speakers. Um, our first speaker will talk to us about sea level rise and our second speaker will talk to us about um, citizen science. And then we'll, we'll go into those breakout rooms. We'll have a great discussion. And then at the very end of the night, we will come back to this main Zoom room and do a little report out and learn a, bit, a little bit more about what we can do. So now we are going to jump into our speakers. Our first speaker tonight is Don Bain. He's a climate engineer, an expert on climate change, adaptation, and sea level rise. He is dedicated to building a bright future in a dramatically changing climate, highly accomplished business executive, and a management consultant. Don is an expert on the implications of sea level rise and has advised municipalities on adaptation, risk management, economics, and finance. So now I'm going to stop sharing my screen and then I will invite Don to share his screen and get started on his presentation. Hi guys, I'm Don. Uh, thank you for the introduction. I also noticed that 100% of the attendees were from planet Earth. So that's good. We've got the right material for the right for this audience. Uh, my colleague, Dan Rizza, is on the line as well. So if you ask me questions while I'm speaking, uh, Dan uh, will probably answer them. So, okay, um, let's get going. Uh, to, to kick things off, I'd like to uh, take a uh, just a moment for a historical perspective. Uh, this is a graph of the last half million years that shows uh, CO2 concentrations in the atmosphere, that's the green in the middle, uh, uh, global temperatures, that's the red, and sea level in blue. And I want you to notice some features of this graph. First, they're very similar in shape, and that's because temperature follows CO2, and sea level follows temperature. Secondly, uh, they have been in a range over the last 500,000 years, except for one, the CO2 concentration, which is normally hovered between, you know, high, just below 200 to just below 300 parts per million, has now spiked to a, a 410 parts per million. You can barely see it on this graph, but there's a, there's a spike uh, in the, at the very end that takes us up to 410. The other uh, features I'd like to show is that the last time, you see the temperatures we have here in red? These are the temperatures we have now. The last time we had temperatures that are similar was the Emian period uh, some time ago. And look at what sea level was back then. Um, it was nine meters, uh, almost 30 feet, 29 and a half feet higher than it is today. So if that's any indication of what we can expect, and it is, uh, then, you know, take note. Here, I wanna, I wanna zoom in. I showed you that green spike, but now I've, I've just zoomed in to the CO2 emissions over the last, um, uh, the last century or so. Um, and uh, here you see it, it's not so much a spike, but you see it building. Uh, here I've uh, shown the last 30 years. In the last 30 years, we have 
uh, manufactured CO2 emissions, uh, uh, more than half uh, that have been produced since the industrial revolution uh, began. So everybody on this call, we own these. These are the ones that, uh, that we had a hand in creating. My grandparents didn't know about this, uh, this phenomenon what was going on, uh, but we do. So next, let's turn to uh, sea level rise, Z uh, again, zooming in. This graph is from the uh, fourth national climate assessment uh, from our friends at NOAA, and it shows uh, sea level uh, basically flat uh, prior to 1900. In fact, it's been uh, stable for the last 5,000 years, which coincidentally is when people started writing down history for uh, for humankind. So, uh, you know, humans kind of grew up thinking uh, that sea level uh, is constant. Around 1900, it started moving. It got a first uh, derivative. I tell my, my car friends that it went from neutral to first gear. And uh, it slowly started rising because of those CO2 uh, increases that began with the in Industrial Resolution, uh, Revolution. In 1993, it shifted gears again. Uh, so it, it moved to second gear uh, and it's picking up speed and it's about to, to shift uh, again. Um, uh, going forward, we have a number of, of trajectories that are possible outcomes. Now this graph uh, tops out at two and a half meters and the year 2100. We start, first started making these graphs in 1985 when nobody could imagine anyone being alive at 2100 to find out if we were right or not. That's no longer true. So there's people alive today that are going to find out this answer. Secondly, uh, that two and a half meters uh, is small compared to that difference I, I showed you earlier of nine meters. Uh, so uh, don't think of these various levels as endpoints. They're just um, uh, levels that we're passing through as we go higher. It turns out one of the biggest challenges that we all have is which one of these pathways we will follow. Uh, if we follow this, uh, the uh, ones with the lower slope, we'll have a better chance of adapting. We'll be, have a better chance to adjust our, bu our uh, budgets, do the actions that you're gonna be take, take, talking about later this evening, and not overwhelming our economy or our capacity to adapt. If we get on these upper, uh, upper slopes, then that's going to be uh, much more of a challenge. Okay, uh, here's something that um, I, I like to point out. I took those two graphs that you've seen before, the emissions and the sea level, and I put them on the same time scale. And uh, notice the features again. First, they have the same shape, right? But there's a lag or there there's a delay. And uh, what's the reason for that? Well, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's the time it takes to change the temperature of the ocean. Uh, turns out there's a significant time lag on the order of 100 years uh, to change the temperature of the ocean. What are the implications of that? Uh, we have put a lot of heat into the ocean as a result of our emissions. And uh, there is a lot of sea level rise coming as a result. Consequently, you know, I described to my friends, that's like um, having a few drinks and going on Amazon and ordering stuff and then have it show up later that you didn't realize. Well, we've got a lot uh, that's coming later that we've already committed to. We've hit the buy button before. So uh, what do we do about this? Climate Central has built some tools by the way, I'm going to ask you to write three things down. Uh, this is the first one, and my colleague Dan is going to put it in the chat uh, room. We've built uh, some tools that allow us to explore uh, what will happen. The first one is at coastal.climatecentral.org. I think you're going to need this, uh, perhaps when you uh, are doing uh, your breakout sessions. Let me stand by here. Uh, I'm going to... Do the switch. Uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna take you to that URL, coastal.climatecentral.org. When you type in a location, I've typed in uh, Miami Beach, it's gonna bring up a map. This map is a Google map. This is all built on Google Earth, uh, Google Earth Engine. Uh, and if 
you're all familiar with Google Earth, uh, or, or rather Google Maps, so you can zoom and pan, uh, choose satellite view, uh, et cetera. Uh, and you can use this tool to find your house, find your church, find your uh, school, et cetera. The way it works is you choose a map, uh, which in this case, we're going to choose a year map. Uh, what that does, it allows us to for this to act like a time machine. When we've chosen a year map, uh, we get a, a year slider here that allows us to uh, change the, the uh, view into the future. So I pick a, a year into the future and I can look at areas that when uh, shaded red are likely to be, low, be below the waterline. There's a button here, which I invite you to explore which allows you to choose the water level, it can be sea level rise only, uh, sea level rise plus an annual flood, sea level rise plus a, a 10 year flood, and different scenarios, including uh, different emission scenarios. I am aware of the time, I wanna go quickly, uh, but this is the first thing you, uh, I'd like you to look at uh, and remember coastal.climatecentral.org. The second is a catalog. We've built a tool that is a catalog of the things that are at risk. It's at riskfinder.org. <clears throat> Dan is putting that in the chat window. I encourage you to, uh, to write it down as well. Enter in a location you care about, like Boston. Sorry. Uh, <clears throat> and it will bring up all kinds of information that uh, will be helpful as you uh, plan your adaptation, uh, make your adaptation plans. Uh, I encourage you to download uh, the local fact sheets and reports. And then I encourage you to scroll down. This is where the catalog comes in. The way this works is um, there's a number of tabs here, population, buildings, infrastructure, contamination risk, and land. This is a water slider. What this tells us is at five feet in the Boston area, here are the population numbers that are at risk. As I change the water levels, I see the population uh, numbers change. I can do that with buildings. I can do that with uh, infrastructure. For example, at four feet, uh, I've got 31 miles of uh, roads that uh, would be below uh, four feet of water in uh, the Boston area. If I go to eight feet, that jumps to 313 uh, miles. This in combination with that other tool is a great way to develop your plans and as I said, catalog what is at risk. Um, Sarah, I'm out of time. Can I have another minute? I... Yeah, absolutely. Oh, great. So <clears throat> we have a number of other uh, other tools that uh, we use to explore this. I want to point them out very quickly. Uh, many of our industrial facilities are built at the water's edge. Here's an example in Philadelphia, uh, Philadelphia Energy Solutions uh, uh, Refinery. Uh, it, it's a very high exposure to sea level rise and flooding. And the environmental cleanup for these facilities has not been adequately costed out. Uh, we have tools that examine those elevations and produce numerical results that show us that this, uh, this refinery is going to be part of the marine environment uh, later this century and certainly next. Unfortunately, it is bankrupt. And so it's now a big question as to who will pay for the cleanup. Uh, so this is, uh, this is one of the many things that, uh, that we need to explore. Uh, <clears throat> We also have uh, an incredible amount of data. The world has gotten very well instrumented uh, with um, meteorological and tide information uh, that feeds these tools and makes them uh, basically available at our fingertips and on our smartphones. Uh, we have data about uh, exposure of buildings. Uh, these are the number of buildings in uh, Atlantic County, New Jersey that are gonna be uh, exposed to high tide flooding over the rest of this century. It, it's a phenomenal number. Here's one of my favorites. Uh, these are par parcels. Parcels are blocks of land that are owned by people that are exposed to high tide. That is, they touch the water. Uh, some of these over here are uh, beachfront now. This graph are, uh, are land parcels 
that are not exposed to water now that but will be. So there's a whole lot of beachfront uh, property owners uh, coming in Atlantic County, New Jersey. Most of them just don't know it yet. So we went over these things very quickly, uh, lots of data. Uh, there are a lot of people paying attention now. Uh, I've been at this for uh, many years and the last two years, the amount of interest and attention has just exploded. One of the most um, interesting aspects lately is this new report from the US Commodity Futures Trading Commission, that's our US government, published a report on managing climate risk to the US financial system. I encourage you to Google that and uh, take a look at it. It's a fascinating read. Lastly, I would uh, leave you with uh, the fact that uh, Dan and I speak with city planners uh, almost every day, and uh, we communicate with finance finance institutions like public bond rate agencies who rate the public debt and people are paying attention. So now is the time for this work. Uh, there's a lot to be done. I encourage you all to uh, engage, use these tools, take them into your community and um, do your part in building a bright uh, and prosperous future for all of us. I'm an optimist. Uh, I can be reached at uh, dbain at climatecentral.org if you have any questions after tonight. And as the presentation goes on, put them in the chat. Dan or I'll try to cover them. Thank you for the time. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you so much, John. Uh, that was so great. Uh, hopefully that gave us a great overview of sea level rise and that was uh, really awesome information. So thank you. And again, um, if you have any questions, you can continue to putting those into the chat and we can answer those for you. So now I'm going to move into our next speaker. I'll do a quick little introduction. Um, our next speaker is Julia Kamari Drapkin. Uh, she is dedicated to connecting communities to each other and their changing environment. She's the CEO and founder of IC Change. Uh, she founded IC Change after over a decade of reporting natural disasters and climate change across the globe and in her own backyard on the Gulf Coast. Under her leadership, IC Change has received national and regional awards, as well as recognition from the Obama White House Climate Data Initiative, NASA, MIT, MIT Solve, and many more. So now I would like to invite Julia uh, to share her screen and teach us more about this uh, topic. Hey, I rarely get the full buyer treatment, but thanks for that, Sarah ben <laughs> Benson. Um, but yeah, I'm Julia, and I'm just Julia, um, just like one of you, um, in the sense that we are climate impacted, all of us, right? Um, totally. So I'm starting with my um, favorite people uh, in this uh, slideshow. Um, and so you will recognize some of the names of the organizers in this presentation, because they've been active users of IC Change, and they have great example posts. And I'm also starting with something pretty familiar. Uh, this was your most recent Snocktober, <laughs> Snow Halloween. <laughs> um, and we've been tracking, uh, you know, changes in the Boston area for many years now. And, uh, you know, we have saw early signals of uh, warmth last year and kind of early spring events and drought events. and. And when you get a lot of warmth in the Northeast, you can also ironically get some precipitation. So this is uh, David talking about what he's seeing um, from, from the recent snow and noticing that it's heavy and it's making the trees kind of bend over and it's, it's, it's striking him as something that's noticeable. That is the beautiful thing about IC change is that those little details add up to bigger picture data sets that are really critical. Um, and so I'm gonna focus on sea level rise, but I want y'all to know from all around the country and the world um, that you can use IC change in more ways than one. One of the things that we really love about IC change also is context. Um, so uh, a fellow Bostonian who happens to be a member of my team chimed in on David's um, post recently and provided some context about recent events. The thing about, um, about these extraordinary changes that Don was discussing is that they're happening really rapidly. They were happening slowly. They're now happening at a much, rapid, much faster pace. But the human um, ability to adapt is incredibly uh, powerful. Our, um, our social science suggests that our norms can change within a window of two to eight years. And when you think about the, the stakes when it comes to mitigating our climate, 
um, that's, that's that same window. We're talking about, you know, nine years, 10 years to really make a difference. So really being able to remind ourselves and understand change over time is actually critical for us to understand what is normal, what is not, what has changed and how we need to adapt. Um, so yes, um, I'm Julia and my background is actually in research anthropology, but I was a veteran climate science reporter for well over a decade. Um, I am a Gulf Coast native. I, I grew up on a barrier island off the coast of Florida and I currently live in New Orleans. So I claim the whole Gulf Coast, which is a front line uh, in more ways than one for climate change. But I'm um, a mom, mom first and foremost. And so all of what I do um, really is grounded in, in knowing that it really matters for both me and my, my family. Um, and I'm surrounded by an incredible team who are, is on this call. Um, some of the members are on this call, Lindsay Wagner, who's based in Boston and Sam um, Harrington. Um, so our mission and our approach, I see change as mission is to connect people to their changing environments to make solutions together. That's the critical part is to use the data to actually make a change, to change our communities for the better. Uh, we're mission oriented. We crowdsource and analyze community micro data to inform project planning and design. But what we're really, we're doing that through connecting people's um, climate stories together. So you can see that we're mobilizing communities to do this at scale, um, share their stories, their photos and their weather measurements. We're, our goal is to create more dialogue around neighbors so that we can learn in an open learning environment. Um, one thing to consider when it comes to weather and climate is your neighbor is your first responder. So making sure that you understand who's at risk where and how to connect is actually pretty important. And we're building community power and cohesion in response to our climate crisis. So it's not just about data, it's about, um, about you know, community power. Um, we are making this space appeal to as many um, people who want to participate. Um, and we know that climate impacts are overlapping. And um, so there's lots of ways that you can use I see change. Um, we participate in, you know, and people from all around the world are coming to us to participate in creating a public record of the lived experience with weather and climate, building aware, awareness and evidence uh, for local climate and weather concerns, and adding insights and critical data. Uh, and we'll talk more about that in detail um, shortly. But, um, and we have partners, public partners who are working on infrastructure, policy, or education. Um, and all three are really critical for, for adapting. I, I just threw this in um, because I love this. Uh, we have a lot of students all around the country, teachers, classrooms who use I see change. Um, there, you know, there's a lot of students in Massachusetts. Um, sometimes the posts are just, you know, banal, but you, you get involved, you say, oh, that's great. And you want, you want them to, to just pay attention. And we love that about I see change, that, that it really just, it creates those critical STEM skills. But that, uh, you know, occasionally you get a good one. And um, we know that you've had a mild winter in the Northeast. Last, last winter, um, that it was a drier, uh, warmer uh, year for y'all. And to see more small mammals is actually part of that pattern. Um, so this is a kid who's saying he's seen a lot more squirrels eating his pumpkins. Uh, so it's just, again, there's, there's lots of opportunities to engage and understand stories and data. Um, but creating an account is really easy. Um, it's just like your traditional social media. Uh, this is one totally focused on climate. Location is really important so that we understand how to tease up investigations that really matter to you. Where we have local partners, such as the Museum of Science in Boston, who is our Boston partner, you will uh, see their investigations first in the feed. Um, and, um, and we do that to make the, the space really localized. So it's general, but when we're really doing that specific granular work, it's very custom. But in Greater Boston, we, we hear a lot. And, and actually going through the feed this last uh, to prepare for this was fun because you can see the whole cycle of change, um, such strong phenology and seasonality. Um, obviously there's nor'easters and flooding. We've seen fall colors and spring blooms moving in over time. Drought um, and Northeastern drought is actually very different than Western drought. Um, changes with the trees, extreme heat. Um, we've worked with the Museum of Science in Boston on heat investigations and, and continue to do that work. Um, we talk about allergies on icy change, coastal changes, changes in people's gardens. I know there's a lot of folks who are backyard gardeners in, in greater Boston. All of that is, is, is part of the, the package here. But we're here to talk about um, sea level rise. And I pulled this out because um, it's a really interesting way to kind of think through what are we seeing today and how does it work towards a model in the future? And I'll kind of talk about how we handle our modeling. But basically modeling, like a lot of what Don was 
was presenting is really important part of it. It's, but modeling is our best guess of what is going to happen. And we need ways to validate models. Uh, and that's why your stories and your data really, really are important because our best guess may not be truly capturing all the risk or the impacts that these um, forces are, um, are, are, are changing in our communities. So when it comes to the problem, it's you know, seeing the problem like this. When we look at a model data, when we look at a graph, um, we, some of these models are created and they're outdated as soon as they're created. Um, some of them are averaging um, intersections. Some of them are not accounting for variation, but most importantly, they're lacking granularity and context. Um, and on top of that, on top of just relying on models, we, we know that public meetings um, are not truly equitable. So when cities are trying to decide on how to adapt to sea level rise or any name that climate change impact, um, they're doing it in rooms like this and the public is not you need, you need to hear from the most, the people who are most impacted by climate change are not able to come. Um, this is an, an incredible you know, opportunity. I, I love the way the um, Museum of Science in Boston convenes community together. Um, but in, in the daily practice of making these decisions from the city's perspective or an engineering perspective or design perspective, um, we're not really hearing from the people we need to hear from the most. And it is the people who are least likely to attend a public meeting or least likely to be civically active who have the most to share. Um, and so there's so many details about these uh, flooding events, heat events, uh, wildfire and um, drought events that we're missing when we don't include their voices and their, and their daily life experiences. Um, we have been working on sea level rise and flooding in more ways than one. I guess Ocean City is also a very popular place or coastal New Jersey to talk about these things because they're seeing such rapid fire flood events. Um, we've been working with the community in Ocean City, New Jersey. Um, they've been documenting both uh, tidal flooding, sea level rise flooding from king tides, which we'll talk about soon, as well as rain fed flooding. And they're doing it together. And what we've, what we've been able to show is that the NOAA models, the guess about what um, you know, future um, tidal events should be producing, it will be 20 flood events in a given year from king tide or a sunny day event. That means that when there's a high tide, um, th there's flooding in the community, but, and that just from that alone. But when you add rain in to the picture, we're seeing 40. That's double what NOAA's model is predicting. And that was last year. In 2020, with the community data, we're likely going to be seeing more. So um, our platform was able to not only do that kind of granular data validation of the model, um, add insights to the model, but we actually have community members using IC Change to advocate for solutions. So when they have pump infrastructure that works, they are advocating on, um, amongst their neighbors uh, on IC Change to get more of it in different parts of the community as well as other coastal communities on the New Jersey coast. So things that were once controversial are now being advocated for from the community up, bottom up, um, instead of top down. And that's really what you need. You need both together, motivated and advocating for solutions. And so we're actually gonna be expanding our work in coastal New Jersey, hopefully in 2021. Um, so um, we've also worked on heat, um, a lot of, uh, again, adding uh, stories and data to the mix. We've modeled indoor urban heat waves. Um, and we've done some work on outdoor urban, uh, outdoor urban heat waves with the Museum of Science in Boston, but we proved that um, NOAA uh, heat warnings are not quite hitting um, the, the most at risk um, because these heat events are happening days before uh, a heat wave is announced and up to a week after based on the buildings trapping heat. And we know that that's an issue in, in Boston as well. Um, and we'd love to continue that work with some of y'all. Um, but this is the work that you know, we really point to when it comes to how data from community members can be used to make permanent changes. Um, in New Orleans, where we were the recipient of um, national resilience design competition money to, uh, funded by HUD to do massive uh, resilience district work, we um, added um, we documented 29 flood events and proved that the models were wrong, um, that the flooding was happening in different areas and underestimating the floods. So the design, uh, thanks to the community, was the, the models were redone 
and six million dollars were added to these projects, uh, more than doubling the capacity of an underground storage unit uh, in a low-income neighborhood that wasn't receiving the attention and the resources it needed. And it will be the largest stormwater unit in the South. So your data matters, really matters. Um, and so you can do this. So uh, again, we've loved working with Museum of Science in Boston on heat. Um, and you know, we can. There's a link there that I can put into the chat where you can read all about the work we did last year with y'all and just enjoyed it so much, uh, learned so much. Um, but this is what we're talking about right now, wicked high tides. Um, so the goal is to potentially use IC change uh, to gather stories, images, and data around um, high tides and king tides. Um, we know that nor'easters add a lot of punch to those tides, and we've seen flooding in the past from those events. Um, and as, as granular data that we can add to those models, the better. So you can add rain totals to icy change. You can add uh, the duration of a storm event, which changes block to block even. Um, you can add flood height if you wanted to go and measure this stuff. Um, and, and you can add that data using instrumentation. This is actually from yesterday. Um, we are working with the city of Miami. Um, we work directly with cities uh, to do this work as well as, as, as groups like the Museum of Science in Boston. Um, and she's out there <laughs> measuring flood height. She's got rain gauges. Um, and if you wanna see the, the flood feed from Etta, it is incredible. But you do not need to have instrumentation to do that. Um, you can just use your eyes. Uh, so this is Sarah's post from downtown Boston uh, in February. Um, and what's great about this photo is that it is a place where she can always go back to and to retake that picture and look at change over time. So you can put in the one data point and that's great. What's better is to come back to that point um, more than once and show us change over time. Um, this is one of my favorite posts. And again, I'll put the post link into the chat. This is from Sylvia Scharf from Dorchester. Um, she is adding not just a picture of flooding, she's adding details. She's telling me about a rack line in the parking lot. She's telling me that there has recently um, been a new playground. They removed an old one because of flooding. So that's a change in the social um, and in a public space that you cannot scrape that data. Um, understanding how public places have changed over time and with respect to these threats and impacts is critical. Uh, she photographed that rack line. That's a, that is how water, that is a high point um, the, that the water reached during this event. And that is something that hydrologists and engineers need. So great data, Sylvia. Um, and, um, um, but we don't always wanna just talk about um, problems. We wanna talk about solutions on IC change too. Um, so we wanna talk about where we can improve drainage. We wanna talk about where places where we can storm rainwater. Um, so ideas from the community really matter um, in terms of like generating the, the energy you need to see that, that happen. Um, and the community often has great ideas that most people don't think of. So we really truly believe that the greatest sensor in when it comes to climate change is, and the smartest, most resilient sensor is you, people. Um, they're missing in the data. Uh, we are a qualitative and quantitative data tool that allows us to really understand these impacts in more ways than one. Um, you can find us on icchange.org. I'm Julia at icchange.org and I'll throw down some links in the chat because um, I don't um, want to go much over. Um, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Julia. That was so great. Uh, yeah, again, feel free to type in any questions you have in the chat and we'll drop some links in there as well. Um, so I wanna thank both of our speakers. We don't have time for an official Q&A, but again, if you have any questions, pop it in the chat and then also make sure to go to coastal.climatecentral.org and also to icchange.org. All right. So now we are going to move in to the deliberation part of the event. So I'm gonna share my screen. So we've learned all about sea level rise and community science today, and we're trying to figure out how we can incorporate that together. So this project is all about connecting, learning about these ideas and um, discussing them in a way that we can have this meaningful conversation. 
So on this slide, you'll see a photo from a past forum. You'll notice that usually we're at round tables. We have people from different backgrounds, different walks of life, uh, different generations sitting together at these round tables and having discussions and sharing their ideas. And that's what these forums are all about. They're having an active and purposeful discussion about a topic. Today, we won't be at a round table, but we will be in a Zoom breakout group. So hopefully it will give you the same feel. But as you can see in the bottom left corner, there are three main things that come together to make a great forum topic. There is social values, scientific evidence, and personal experience. You need all three of these to come together to answer a question that can't be answered by just one of those things. It's not just science or just personal. It's a multi-directional conversation that includes a bunch of diverse perspectives. So our past forum topics can vary uh, from climate resilience, like we are doing today, uh, human genome editing, infectious diseases, protecting the planet Earth from asteroids, high school start time, self-driving cars. Mm -hmm. All of these topics not only have an interesting scientific policy impacts, but also their impact to society in some way. And so out of forum, our goal is to bring together all of these aspects to answer a question or to solve a problem or to help inform future decision making. So now I'm going to have um, Emily, if you can, launch a poll. Uh, it is what if you've been to a forum like this before, either if you've been to one at the Museum of Science before, if you've been to one across the country, or maybe even if you've held a uh, forum before. All right, they're coming in. A lot of people have been to forums before, which is so exciting. Awesome. Well, we're getting down to about half and half, so we have some new people as well. Cool, well, I'm really excited that a lot of people have joined us before, um, but also that we have new people to come and learn about uh, this forum experience. So today, the forum that we are doing is all about sea level rise. So after I do a quick introduction, we're going to break out into small groups and we're going to make a resilience plan for sea level rise in the town of Kingtown. So Kingtown has assembled a team of city planners, scientists and engineers and all of you to come up with options for resilience. They've chosen three options or resilience strategies and have ranked them on economic, environmental and social values. So today in your group, you will act as a resilience planning team for the city of Kingtown. Your team's task is to create a plan that protects Kingtown while also considering the values of people who live there, the impacts on the economy, and the effects of the environment on the city. Your group facilitators will help you follow the steps to create your plan, and then you'll be able to explore how that plan uh, ended up using visualizations. But before we make a plan, it's best to learn a little bit more about the people who live there. So now I'm going to share my screen here. So just a little bit more about um, the town of Kingtown. So welcome. So as we have already heard, according to the National Climate Assessment, global sea level rise has risen about eight inches in certain areas uh, since record keeping began in 1880. It's projected to rise another one to four feet. In the town of Kingtown, sea levels has ris risen by a foot over the last century. Some of the sunny day or nuisance flooding occurs at high tide, even when there's no precipitation or strong winds. Kingtown is now prone to flooding on the streets at high tides and during coastal storms. This matters because the structures we build to protect ourselves are built at the sea levels that people experienced a century or more ago. When we find high tide and waves and storm surge on top of this, the sea levels that we are experiencing, water washes on shore. This means that Kingtown needs to become more resilient. So here is a map of Kingtown. This is the current map of what Kingtown looks like. And this is what Kingtown will look like when we have four feet of sea level rise. So before we make a resilience plan for Kingtown, we should know a little bit about the people who live there and the property value. With four feet of sea level rise in Kingtown, 
Uh, this is the estimated population density that would be impacted. And we will put this link in the chat as well so you can all uh, touch this and learn more about this information. This is the estimated property value that will be impacted by four feet of sea level rise in Kingtown. Now let's learn a little bit more about some of the infrastructures that could be impacted by flooding. The first is Kingtown Hospital. It provides high quality healthcare and services to programs and city residents. The current building is about 20 years old and serves a number of low income neighborhoods. The city's recent vulnerability assessment identified the hospital as being vulnerable to coastal flooding as sea levels rise. Central Station serves as a hub for regional railway and bus service and is the main connection point. If the station is flooded, service will be disrupted. The power plant supplies the greater Kingtown metro area with electricity from natural gas. The plant is about 10 years old and has a planned lifespan for at least 20 more years. But the city's recent flooding vulnerability assessment named the power station as a crucial element of infrastructure that must be protected from future flooding as sea levels rise. The AeroEng corporate headquarters or the international aerospace engineering firm recently built some new offices uh, they originally were hesitant to relocate near the water because of possible flood risks, but they moved forward with the plan after the city offered tax incentives. The oyster beds along the South Kingtown Beach have sustained oyster harvesters for generations. In recent years, farmed oysters and mussels have provided a way for fishermen to embrace more sustainable practices while providing ways for the city to promote economic development and tourism. This shows the rate, uh, roadways in red are major travel arteries that are flooded and now impossible with four foot of sea level rise. This is the neighborhood along the Eastern Sand Bar that is highly vulnerable to sea level rise. Property values are high here because of the coastal views. Here is a view of the neighborhood at the current level as you see on the left, and here's what it would look like uh, with four feet of sea level rise. So here's a map showing what the four foot sea level rise would look like in Kingtown. Notice how much the main roadways and other infrastructures are impacted. And as we pop this in the chat, you should be able to zoom in with that as well. So now you will be building a resilience plan for Kingtown. You will consider the stakeholders of who live there prioritize their values of the resilience plans, make your own resilience plan, and then you'll get to explore how your resilience plan impacted Kingtown. Before we jump into those breakout rooms, um, we have some ground rules for good discussion. Uh, like I mentioned, you will have a facilitator in each of your rooms that are gonna help you through this process. So make sure to follow the lead facilitator. Uh, try to keep yourself on mute if you're not speaking, but feel free to unmute yourself and talk this entire time. Like I mentioned, turn your video on to be more engaged, but if you don't want to, you don't have to. Uh, respect others' opinions and ideas. Try to have one person talk at a time. I know it's very difficult on Zoom, um, so do your best. Um, make sure to listen what others have to say, and it's okay to disagree with others. This is part of a discussion. Uh, make sure everyone has the chance to speak, focus on the subject of sea level rise. Um, this is going to be quick. It's, we have 70 minutes in these groups, but it'll go by really fast and you'll see. So try to keep the comments brief. Your facilitator in your group is going to be the timekeeper and the moderator. They're also neutral, so they're just helping you move the discussion as long, but they're not going to quite participate in the discussion. So now, um, we are going to go into breakout rooms. So let me stop sharing. And um, we should have automatically assigned you into breakout rooms. So once we press the button, you guys should go in automatically and your facilitator will introduce themselves as you go in. David, anything more you need to know before you press the button? Sorry, yeah, you'll see a little uh, button to join after I invite you. If you have trouble finding it, just stick around and we'll we'll get you there. But you might have to hit the little three dots on the bottom to see that invitation. So I'll send you now.
So if you haven't joined a room yet, take a look at the bottom of your screen and you should see an invitation to join the room uh, and we'll send you there. I know some of you are speakers, so I didn't send you there. <laughs> I'm looking, I see. I didn't send you, Julia. Um, I'll send other people, but is there anyone that feels like they haven't been able to join a room? Please feel to un unmute yourself. We'll get you where you need to go. Yeah, Julia, we can send you to a room. Um... Yeah, I can send Don or Julia. Sometimes what happens is that these people whose uh, name you see, um, they're sort of, uh, they're already in the room, but they kind of get frozen. Mm, um, yeah. It also could mean that they didn't click on the link to join, but I don't hear any of them talking to us. So <laughs> I think there's also a lot of, you know, like when you're multitasking, you're kind of yeah, like, Wait, what? Sure. Um, yeah, no, uh, thanks so much again for, for doing this, you guys. I love these. Um, so, you know, if you, um, and Sam and Lindsay, I think are both in breakout rooms right. working it. So, too. <laughs> so if you send me to one, really are, one, you're good. Yeah, you can send me one without where Sam and Lindsay are not. Yep, I will send you one. How about you, Don? Do you want to go to a breakout room? Uh, sure. Uh, send me one to where Dan didn't go. Okay, I think I just did that. And hold on. So long. Thanks, guys. Hi, thanks, Don. Um, thanks, Julia. <laughs> Sarah. So I think France, hi, Jack, can you hear us? There's three people. I think Jack has a mic on. <clears throat> he doesn't have audio. Okay. Oh, wait, I forgot. Should I close? The Louise room? and Gwendolyn, are either one of you trying to get into a room? If you're not there, take a look. I'm guessing maybe you're just doing other things or you've joined via something else. Francis, the reason I figured we'd stick around is I just wanted to show both of you this. Um, and Sarah, actually, now I changed it, so it's not going to look like much. But um, so if you go to the actual spreadsheet that has the data in it, Sarah, mm -hmm. what you'll see is that right now it says no data, but I made this separate tab. And if I change the, it to have this be 42, you'll see that this is one, you know, response. Here's a gazillion responses. Oh, sweet. Um, and so I think you should just be able to um, put that up on the screen. I would, I would like um, play around with the labels just to make things a little bit black and bigger. Yeah, for sure. I'm um, going to, yeah. Yeah, because Google does like a gray label instead yeah. of a black label. So it's that's a good idea. Yeah, for sure. But do so, you think that's okay, Sarah? Or do you want me to put into a slide for you? You can download the chart after, after what Francis said, if you'd rather and have it be like a graphic. But the nice thing about doing it this way is that if one of the facilitators puts it in late, it will update in real time. Um, no, I can, yeah, let me just pull it up. And I don't actually think we need this sheet anymore, but I'm gonna leave it just in case. <laughs> um, and I'll get rid of it after. Where do you put the data? David, which cells do you, are you putting, like which cells are the, um, is that chart? Right here. Can you, can you see my screen? I cannot see your screen. Uh, I don't know. Um, oh, I'm not sharing it, am I? Um, how about now? What do you see now? Oh yeah, I see your screen. It's those, it's those. So as people add them, they're gonna go down inside there. And mm -hmm. if I put that, you can see that's just empty. Yeah. If I click on it and I make this, And you can see what happens. Right, because there's data above it, right? There's yeah. data above it, right. So if I do that, it looks like that. Right, right. OK. Ooh. But you're right. We should fix the am... labels. Um, how do I okay, do that? So then you have this, your group's Kingtown recommendations. Is that the PowerPoint that you're going to put it into? 
Well, so I was going to do that, but I don't think we actually need to, because I think if you just bring that that chart up, oh. you'll be able to see it like that. Do you understand what I'm saying? Oh, okay. Yeah, wait, let it's me. Just the tab on the bottom. Yeah, yeah. But Francis is right that I didn't think about the fact that the labels are crummy. So I need to, you know what I need to do? The thing I'm not sure about, Francis, is if I do it like that and I change the labels. Just the borders. We want the labels. Title text. Um, oh, I should be keeping. I think it's under. Um, I, I would have thought it was just listed. Oh, uh, here. How about? Well, you can get into it if you want. It's under the legend. Isn't it under legend? I don't think so. And then mm, I worry that I'm going to change while you're changing. So uh, yeah, you go ahead and do it. I won't touch it right now, and I'll stop sharing for a moment for a minute. See, I can, okay, so I can, I got it. I think you have to click on each one. Text color auto, yeah, right. It's under, it's under legend. Um, Is it? Yeah, yeah, because I went into legend and I yeah. changed legend font size. And then can you see how it, up, has it updated for you yet? It updated that, but it did not update the actual number. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, the numbers always. Yeah, you're right. It is under legend, Francis. I'm sorry. It's no, funny no, no, no. It's okay. You click on it. It comes up with a different thing called text formatting. Text label, oh. auto default value. Yeah, I don't actually know how to change the, the number, the percentage into a different color. Yeah, it doesn't seem to want to let me do that. Yeah. So. I oh, 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 here it is. Slice. Mm. Oh, no, that's oh, it. You made them white. That, that No, that was good what you just did. Okay, that, well, then uh, we can the do. Actual, yeah, that was good. Like the, well, I don't know what color is better. White? White seems better. We can white make seems it better. Much larger. How's that? Yeah, now what I'm worried about is, don't kill me, what happens if I do this? Oh, yeah, yeah, wait, I'm gonna stop pressing buttons. And then if I go back, the concern I have is, oh, yay, it worked, okay. <laughs> um... All right, I think we're good. It worked, yay. I mean, so if you want me to put that into a slide, I can, Sarah. I just thought it might be simpler like this because if it takes them a while, like since we're a little behind time-wise, this will update in real time. Whereas the, I tried it the other way and I don't think it does. No, that's fine. I can share that screen. <clears throat> and then I really, I really only have like one last, I have like two last slides. Um, so I can go back and forth, that's fine. Um, David, I think is your host. Sarah wants to know how you're, what you're thinking about timing. She's freaking out. Who is? Uh, Katie is, sorry. Um, I don't know. Oh, I don't think I ever stopped recording, did I? Sorry. Uh, there was a mass block stormwater. The areas along the southern sandbars and certain other areas will be phased out for development over time so that the most vulnerable sections outside the protection of the lock will be transformed into natural flood protection zones. Um, so you can see that this is how the plan helped to manage the flooding in Kingtown. So really awesome. Um, we'll put this link in the chat again so that you can, if you didn't have a time to fully uh, visualize the plan that your team chose, you can do so right online. This is open access so you can 
you can look at it whenever you want. Um, but before we go, I just have a couple of more housekeeping things just to finish, finish it all up. So let me share my screen again to this page. Um, so one thing that you can do, even though today we talked about resiliency plannings and we did it for this fake town of Kingtown, um, that doesn't mean that dealing with sea level rise and resiliency planning needs to end when you leave this Zoom room today. Um, so one thing that's really easy to do is participating in citizen or community science. Um, so Julia already talked to us a lot about this today, but, but community science is really that scientific work that's undertaken by members of the general public. And so sea levels are rising and resiliency planners need to know more information about what areas are flooding. So we have two projects. Um, one is My Coast. This is more specific for people who live in Massachusetts. Um, that data goes to the Massachusetts Office of Coastal Zone Management. But then I see change as well. As Julia told us all about, there is an investigation called High Tides and Sea Level Rise and uh, that will help resiliency planners know what places are flooding. Um, IC Change also has a ton of other investigations. So it's not just high tides and sea level rise. Uh, it can be extreme heat. Um, I've been posting my leaves changing or weird weather or really anything that happens outside in your neighborhood. Those are really pretty um, leaves, by the way. Um, but yeah, we're, we're year round um, and very responsive. And we do work directly with cities and engineers uh, whenever we can. Um, and increasingly, like we, we, thanks to the, you know, work, work at the Museum of Science in Boston, we, you know, talk to lots of folks, um, like, and uh, we appreciate y'all. Yes, thank you. I'm so excited to have you on, and it's such a fun app, and it definitely gets almost addictive. And you're like, I have to show off what happened. I was like, my leaves are changing. And, and since I've been doing it for over a year, I can now see uh, like last year, what time my leaves changed. Um, and I'm able to even compare my own neighborhood with my own data. Um, so hopefully you all check that out and participate more in citizen science. Um, so one last thing before uh, we go is that we are really excited that you were able to participate in this forum, um, but we're working with our museum's research and evaluation department to help improve this program. But to do so, we need your feedback. So um, we have about a five minute survey about your experience today. Uh, feel free to share your honest feedback, the positive, the negative, uh, to help us make improvements. Uh, Participation is voluntary, all answers are confidential and all questions are optional. Uh, the survey should not make you uncomfortable at all, but it will help us to advance this program and divine, design future activities. So I am going to pop that link in the chat, um, but feel free to use the chat to ask any questions um, that you may have. But otherwise, I want to thank you all so much for being a part of this event tonight. And um, I really hope that you all learn something and gain something from this today. Um, so let me pop that link into the chat. And thank you all so much. You can check out all of our stuff uh, from Museum of Science at MOS.org or MOS at home to learn about our virtual offerings. Uh, but we're also open to the public. So uh, if you would like to go into the museum, you can just need a time ticket. So thank you all so much. And I just pop that survey link into the chat if you have a moment to do that.